Gentlemen, tonight's class we're going to, God willing, learn. We're going to explain and then read, God willing, the Alter Abbas footnote in the second chapter of Tanya, which is quite famous, um, quite well known to all students of the Tanya, referenced in many footnotes in Chassidus. It's a, it's a it's what's called in Yiddish a geshmake sugya. It's a it's a um, it's a juicy topic. It's a tasty topic of study. Um, someone wouldn't mind closing the door. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And the truth is that it is nearly impossible to teach the whole footnote in an hour, first of all, even though we're going to attempt it. Number two, really, really, to really understand this footnote, really one has to already know all of Hasidus anyways. It's an issue, right? The same thing is really true of many areas of Torah study. To really understand any page of the Talmud, really you have to understand all the other pages. It's an issue. Um, that's why the first time you learn through something isn't even doesn't even count, right? The first time is just so uh, you get familiar with the, the nice sounding words, right? And the second time is when you actually even start learning, right? And maybe by the fourth time you really uh, are in a position to your fourth time through the entire work, you're really in a position to uh, to, to understand on your own, right? To understand unaided. So the same is true, especially some parts of the Tanya are much easier to understand even at the simple level. Some parts are much more challenging. There was a general warning before we started learning Tanya at all that some parts of this would be very difficult. Some of you have not forgotten, I can see. The, um, so we are going to be studying something tonight. And the truth is, the Alter Rebbe makes it a footnote. So in other words, in a sense, the Alter Rebbe is telling you that it's parenthetical. You don't really need this information to, to, to understand the second chapter of Tanya fully. However, it does greatly enrich the information in the second chapter of Tanya, and even to have come in contact with some of the, the, the content of this footnote um, without understanding it will help all future study of Hasidus. In other words, you'll see later in, in further studies and other topics how this reinforces and connects with and touches on those topics. So if you um, feel... Um, a bit lost as to the topic of tonight's class. That is, in a way, that's intended because we are only going to try and explain it as best as we can. And at a certain level, there is a level of depth here even more than usual um, when we study Tanya. There is a level of depth here which is going to be apparent, and we don't have the ability or the time to really dive into the depth here because the in touch in this footnote, we touch on things that in Hasidus are written about in literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of discourses. So in other words, we're touching on things that we're touching the tip of a huge iceberg. Um, and so we're going to try and touch it and make off with it make and make out like bandits, make out with a, with a, uh, uh, um, an understanding that helps us for the second chapter of Tanya with what we're discussing. But just know that this is really um, something that we can only really begin to appreciate with a lot more study, especially in the more Kabbalistic aspects of what we're going to be discussing. The second chapter of Tanya, as we have learned, is about the second soul of Israel, which is the divine I am, rather than the I am of the, of the finite self, the finite independent self from God. There is a godly soul within the Jew, which is God saying I am as the inner vitality of the Jew, as the second soul of the Jew. This piece of, this soul, this second soul, the divine I am, as we read in the first chapter of, the first sentence of the second chapter, is a piece of God above, literally. What this means practically, as I keep repeating and we must keep remembering, because the Tanya, ultimately everything, especially in the first part of the Tanya, is absolutely practical. This is all geared towards practice, even though the first dozen or so chapters of Tanya are really expository, are not talking about what our action um, and what to do in a 
as directives. That only comes later in Tanya, but nevertheless, to under even understand the Alter Rebbe's directives, we need, the, as we've ex- discussed before in previous classes, we have to build the Alter Rebbe's whole worldview from the bottom up, right? So we are discussing the soul. The soul is, as we said last door, the divine soul, the godly soul, is the Jew's backdoor access to godliness, right? The Jew does not have to access God as the other, as something else, as someone other than himself, and go and navigate that relationship from the outside, because the Jew on the inside has a connection with God, and this transforms our entire view of what it means to do Avedas Hashem, to serve God, and what it means to live a godly life, and to, to develop love and fear of God, as Tanya will begin, start uh, discussing soon, right? And all of these things, these are all dependent and fundament, uh, dependent on the fundamental fact that the Jew has this backdoor connection. The Jew has Jews by nature as an inheritance, as we'll continue to discuss as we go further in this chapter, Jews have an inherent connection to God. They have a connection with God that is really of God. It's not of them. In other words, it's not something that we create. It's really something that we are given as a fundamental constitutive part of our being. It's what it means to be part of the Jewish people. Yes, as we'll discuss much more as we go on. We began to discuss last week as laying the uh, the the groundwork for the footnote that we're going to learn tonight that the source of the soul is divine wisdom is the wisdom of God right this was one of our metaphors if you recall the Alzheimer Rebbe gives several metaphors for what it means to be a piece of God and the final metaphor is the metaphor of giving birth to a son that just as the son is a part of his father so too this godly soul is a part of God and we say where does the son originate from from the brain of his father and we've now spent two classes where we've discussed a little bit what that means and we'll probably discuss more maybe in a, in a future class and so really the son comes from the mind of the father. That's really the ultimate point that the son derives from, right? And similarly, it says that the Jew Israel arose in the mind of God, as the Midrash famously says, right? Alu Yisrael Israel arose in God's thought, right? Which, we, which the Alter Rebbe reads in the Hasidic fashion to mean that the source of the Jew's soul, of the Jewish soul, is literally in the mind of God. And the mind of God, the wisdom of God, is totally one with God, right? Which is why it says that God, God, God is wise, but not with a known wisdom, right? Because wisdom, as it says in the Kabbalah, because wisdom is, um, you would think that all wisdom by being wisdom is in some way known, right? But the idea is that because God's wisdom is absolutely one with him, and he is totally unknowable, right? Therefore, God's wisdom is also unknown. It's not the it's not the known wisdom, it's the unknown wisdom. In last week's class, we continued to explain what the Rambam, what Maimonides means by the, the knower, the knowledge, and the known, right? The Yedea and the Yedua and the Mada, right? The or the Das. What does it mean that God is the knower, the knowledge, and the known? So last week we did a very brief crash course in holy Jewish philosophy in Chakira, and we explained that there must be some being who is absolutely one, who is the source of all things, right? However, if he's absolutely one, then we have a, a difficult time understanding what it means that he knows things, right? What does it mean? The Torah says God knows things, right? What does it mean for God to know? Because the truth is that when we think of our knowledge, right, our knowledge is constantly changed by the things that we know. And when we learn more, our knowledge changes, right? And not even when we learn more, but if the nature of the thing that we know changes, right? I said, if this cup, I know this cup is right here, but if it moves here, now I know it's there, right? And if you have a universe that's constantly changing, as our universe is, right, as the, which is the, um, in a way, the basis for finding God, right, is we need something to explain how a multifarious, a many-parted, a a complex universe could arise, right? So we explain it comes from an absolutely simple God who is absolutely one. But on the other hand, if he's absolutely simple, how can he know, right? The Rambam's conclusion, or the Rambam's answer, rather, to this question of how can God be absolutely simple and yet no, no things, right? No things in our that are going on in our finite world, that things change, right? How could that be? 
And the answer is, is we don't know. That's the answer. That's the Rambam's answer. The way the Rambam says we don't know is by saying that in God, the knower, the knowledge, and the known are all one. Which by which the Rambam means, to translate that into something a little bit more accessible, what the Rambam means by that is that God does not know like we know. The way God knows things has nothing to do with the way we know. The way we know is a separate faculty from the soul, right? In other words, there's me, and then there's my mind, my knowledge, the things that I know, right? My wisdom. None of these things are me. These are all things that I possess, right? Whereas in God, there is no distinction between him, the knowledge that he possesses, and the thing that he knows, right? A different way we've said this in this class many, uh, many moons ago is that God knows everything by knowing himself, right? which is not something that we really understand what that could possibly mean, right? Nevertheless, the Rambam's point is that there's no reason to assume that the way God gets to his knowledge is in a human way. Why would you assume that, right? After all, you've already said God is different than everything else because he's completely simple, right? Which is already a statement that God is totally unlike anything that we recognize in our reality, Right, God is already totally different. So if he's totally different, then let the way that he knows also be totally different. Right? The way God knows things is not it is not the human way of knowing. It's totally other. It's a different way of knowing. Right? This is what the Rambam calls the knower, the knowledge, and the known. And really what the Rambam means by this is that you can't even say, just like you can't say that God exists, as we've discussed many times in this class, you also can't say that God knows. In other words, what we call knowing, right, really any word you would ascribe, any description you would ascribe to God, right, any description, any descriptive um, adjective, right, that you would say God is wise, God is knowing, right, all of these words, God possesses the quality, but not within our definition of the term, right? Because our definition, to say he shares that definition with us, is already putting limits on God and violates his perfect simplicity, as we've been discussing. To say he knows like we know, we know means that he's not perfectly simple, because in us, our knowledge is complex, and it makes us complex. There's us and our knowledge. There's different parts, right? God has no part. Arts. So the way that he knows is totally mysterious. We don't call it, when we say he's wise, the Rambam would tell you, what we really mean is that he's not unwise. But what he actually is, no one could say, right? This is called in Hebrew, Yediyas Hashlila, right? Which means the negative knowledge, right? It has a Latin name, the Via Negativa, um, mostly used by a different religion, not ours, Lahavil. You also have, um, you also have, it's also called apophatic theology, if that's useful for you. It's like saying phylacteries, right? It doesn't help, doesn't help anything. The only people on earth who know what phylacteries are know what tefillin are and vice versa. So there's no reason for it to have an English word, right? Why do they go to simple? Why do define What? You have to, the reason you say, that's a good question, the, it would have been more clear, the reason you didn't have the question in last week's class is because in last week's class we spent time explaining how the God that the philosopher needs to explain our reality must be simple by definition. Because if he had parts, he couldn't explain. The whole reason you arrive at God, right, to the philosopher, is because you need something to explain the complex things of our reality. If, if things are made up of parts, then I need a more broad or a more general context in which they are united in a unity, right? To be very, very briefly, I'm saying. So in other words, to say that the table legs and the surface of the table together make one table means that there's what we would call in Hebrew, there's a klal, there's a general principle, good evening, good evening, there's a general principle which, um, in which the, the, the legs of the table and the surface of the table subsist, right? It can't be that there's just the legs and just the surface because the legs and surface don't make a table. If the legs of the table are on one side of the landfill and the surface is on the other side, you don't have a table. What makes them a table, what makes them one thing is that clearly there is some unity Right, that they that they that they share when they're arranged in the in the correct way. But that unity is not the surface or the legs. That unity is a third thing, right? So there must be something that explains why these complex things make one whole. So the the um, 
then, but this thing, which explains why they make one whole, it turns out is also complex, right? Is also multifaceted because in order to explain how something with parts is united, it itself must relate to both of those parts, right? The way that a, a bridge between two land masses has to have a foot on each land mass, right? You have to, it has to explain both. So this third thing relates to both of the other two, which means it itself is complex, right? This series, if you wish to explain how this is a table, right? You ultimately need something that is absolutely simple without parts, right? And that something is God of whom there can only be one and not multiple, et cetera, et cetera. And all the other traits of God, the philosopher usually goes on to explain them then. So I already know that God is simple because that's how I arrived at my understanding of God in the first place. The real question is, is how can he be simple and know? And know things, right, in our world especially. How can you have divine providence? How can you know what's going on? And the answer is, is we don't know. His knowledge is not our knowledge. His way of knowing is not the human way of knowing. At least, that's the Rambam's answer. That's Maimonides' answer. And this is what it says in halacha and Jewish law. It's not just a philosophical opinion. You can go and look it up in Hilchus Yosei De'atera in the first chapters of the Rambam's magnum opus, Mishnah Torah, Right, the 14 books of the Mishnah Torah, right at the very, very beginning in Jewish law, you will see that the Rambam discusses this very issue as fundamental to Jewish theology, which he lines out there. Halachically, the laws of what's, what's, what legally is a Jew required to know about God. Of course, it's a mitzvah to know God and believe in his unity. These are some of the 613 commandments in the yeah. Torah, right? So like all of the 613 commandments, just like there's a certain length that your love has to be. So there's a certain there's a certain way of knowing God and a thing, certain things that are on the list of what you must know about God, right? And there's certain things which are on the list of what pertains to his unity, etc. So you can go see that all in halacha there. And understanding those first two chapters of the Rambam's Mishnah Torah is a whole thing which is not, um, which is far beyond the scope of our class. I will just tell you that it's very, very interesting. I recommend you go read there the first few chapters and see all of the interesting things that the Rambam talks about there. It may surprise you what the Rambam sees as halachically the law that a Jew must know. But anyway. It's a discussion for a different time. So much for the Rambam. That's where we ended last week's class, okay? Now, the goal, the, the structure of to what remains of tonight's class is we're going to have a further discussion, quite a bit of it, and then at the end, we're going to actually read the Alter Abbas footnote. That's the goal, right? And we'll hopefully understand it at least a little bit when we come to read it. Fine. So, the philosophical description of God is disagreed with by many Jewish authorities. The, this understanding of the nature of God is not monolithic in Judaism. It's not the only understanding. There's other understandings. You know that Jews argue about everything, right? Two Jews, three opinions. Certainly, if you're talking about God himself, uh, all the more so. And we find, in particular, the Hasidic source in the Mamarim that the Rebbeim bring in the discourses as the main disagreer and most explicit disagreer with the Rambam is the Maharal of Prague, the famous Maharal, um, Rabbi Lu of Prague, who of course lived centuries after the Rambam, who is most famous to people who know nothing about him for the stories of the Golem, which may not even be true, um, and may not even have a Jewish source, it's a whole discussion for a different time, but the, if you start learning the Torah of the Maharal of Prague, I will tell you as, as personal testimony that the golem quickly becomes the least interesting thing about the Maharal of Prague. The Maharal of Prague is absolutely fascinating, and his Torah is unbelievably rich and profound. The Maharal is a Kabbalist Kabbalist. The Maharal's position is a Kabbalistic position, not a philosophical position, as, as these terms are defined in Judaism, which is not necessarily how they're defined everywhere. But the, the Maharal is from the side that opposes the philosophical position. The Kabbalists as a movement generally have a different conception of God than the Jewish philosophers broadly, right? Obviously, these words I'm using to tell you that it's like much, much, much more complicated than what I'm saying. But broadly, the Kabbalists are in one camp. They're on one side. 
The philosophers are on the other, and the two common champions of these positions, right, are the Rambam speaking for the philosophers, in this capacity anyway, and the Maharal speaking for the Kabbalists in his capacity. The Maharal has one of the Maharal's many fascinating works, is called Gvuras Hashem, which means like the, uh, the might of God, right? And m- most of the Maharal's surviving works are actually attached to different Jewish holidays. So he's good holiday reading, right? Gvuras Hashem, which is a very, quite a, a thick and large book, is all about Pesach, so Maharal's book on Passover, okay? The introduction to Gvuras Hashem, there's, I think there's, I can't remember how many introductions there are. There's like at least three, maybe more. And in the introductions, they're, they're very famous because in the introductions, the Maharal lays out his um, view of certain important issues. Let's put it that way. And the Maharal, from the position of the Kabbalists, attacks the Rambam's understanding of this issue directly. In other words, it's totally explicit. There's no hints. There's no, some people say, the Rambam says, the Maharal says, the Rambam says X, Y, Z. It's absolutely wrong, and this is why. I totally disagree with the Rambam, right? What's the Maharal's problem? The Maharal's problem at the end of the day is quite simple, right? We said, how does the, it's about God's knowledge, right? The Rambam says God's knowledge is absolutely one with God. There is no God's knowledge. There's only God. God only God's. He doesn't knowledge. What we call God's knowledge, that's just our hang up, right? All we're really saying by that is that God is not lacking in wisdom. But we're not saying that he's actually has a faculty called the faculty of knowledge. He actually has a mind apart from him, right? God is absolutely simple. And when you say God's mind or God's knowledge, you're referring to God himself, not to something, not to some aspect of God, right? The Maharal's problem with this is twofold. One is textual, as many things in Judaism are, have both of these aspects. There is a textual disagreement, and there's a logical disagreement, right? In other words, there's a philosophical divergence, and the Maharal, always the second level, which is really maybe the first level, the most important level in Judaism, every debate is also a textual debate in Judaism, right? Because the question is, is who can read their understanding into more things better, as is the discussion on every page of the Talmud, right? That's exactly what Raji and Tosfas are doing all the time. I read this piece of Talmud in a totally different way, each one is saying, and my way is correct, based on my first principles, which I don't bother stating and leave to the reader to figure out. So the, the, um, the, the Rambam, the Rambam says God is his knowledge. The Maharal says explicitly contradicted by the Torah. There's verses in the Torah which says, and God know, and God knew as an active verb, vayada Hashem or vayeda Hashem, and God knew. Active verb, active verb. In other words, it's not saying, and God was his knowledge, right? The Torah explicitly says, and God knew is an active verb. He did the act of knowledge, just like a human, sounds like just like a human being did. Now, of course, okay, but of course, the way that the Rambam would explain this is that the Torah speaks is speaking in purely metaphorical language, right, purely for a human being, right, rather than actually, it's not actually a verb, right? The way the Rambam understands, by the way, just so you understand the, the depth of the Maharal's dissatisfaction, the way that the Rambam said, and this is, I'm not, this, the Rambam basically says this very directly in the Mora Nevuchim, in the, in the Guide for the Perplexed. The Rambam says that all actions ascribed to God are all um, not real descriptions, and they're all for human benefit. So in other words, if, if you tell the Rambam, at least as the Rambam is working within what he says in the Guide for the Perplexed, if you tell the Guide for the Perplexed, let's put it that way, if you tell the Mora Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed, that the Torah says God loves you. Yeah? The Maranavuchim, the Maranavuchim would say, when the Torah says God loves you, right, which of course no one could disagree with because it's explicit in the Torah, right? But what does the Torah mean? The Torah means that you, in your perception of the unchanging God who possesses no feelings and no faculty of love, right? You and your perception have been dealt with in a way that were God human, right? You would deduce that that human must have feelings for you of love, right? So in other words, God has no feelings. 
things, or knowledge, or anything else, right? God just, it's all in your perception, right? Your limited perception. It's like the famous story of the of the blind men that are asked to guess what the elephant is, right? You know the story, and they're all blind. So one says the elephant is a big wall, right? And one says, no, the elephant's a rope, right? Because none of them can feel, none of them is big enough to feel the whole elephant, right? And each one gets only their part, right? Something roughly analogous to this is what the Rambam says is like when you say God loves you or God hates you, for that matter, if you're being punished, right? God has no feelings that can change on one way or the other. God has no feelings at all. We're describing behaviors as if those behaviors have underlying quality. And you can see from this description maybe a little bit a little bit of insight into why this for some of us this may be deeply unsatisfying. What yes. About what about them? Yes, it's all this it's the same idea. It's the same idea. God has no traits. You can't say God has traits, he's absolutely simple. Right? There's no traits. The Rambam, I'll give you a, good, a different question. What about the Shekhinah? What about the presence of God, which is described throughout the Torah, right? The Rambam says that anything that is a, is a presence or an attribute, if you want to say these things actually do exist, the way they exist is it's just another creation, right? There's only two categories of things. There's the absolutely simple God, and there's creations. There's nothing in between, right? So how God No. God is God has judgment by which we mean he's not lacking in judgment but that doesn't mean he has any quality of judgment God gods and by result you are judged or loved etc yes I have a I have a little bit of a problem with the way that it's like in the way that I think we yeah. have is that like on one level you're absolutely Right. Well, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm just telling you what the Rambam says in Mor Nevuchim. I haven't gotten to what Tanya says. I haven't even got to what the Maharal says, for that matter. I'm just telling you what the Rambam says in Mor Nevuchim. Right? It's a pick your poison. Right? If you want to say that God actually loves you, you have profound issues in the simplicity of God. Right? I'm just explaining to you the tension. So the Rambam is saying that it's better or the, the the correct choice the way it is right is that god is absolutely simple we need god to be absolutely simple to be god it's fundamental to his definition and all of this relational stuff right all of that is the one that's going to have to be non-literal right it's all that is going to have to be the one where god gods and then the human being understands parses receives in the way that he receives yes yeah. From the Rambam's perspective, yeah. is he not giving any, he's not bringing in the understanding of Kabbalah at all? Allegedly not. I don't want to overcomplicate things. The question of what the Rambam himself actually at the end of the day believes is very is a very controversial to this day, a very controversial question. But th- according to what he explicitly says in Moran Nevuchim, no, there's no Kabbalah. There's certainly no explicit Kabbalah. Interestingly, the Maharal of Prague, which is what one of the things that makes him so fascinating, is that he is also rarely Kabbalistically explicit, right? It just shouts from every word implicitly that he's talking about the Kabbalah. But what's interesting, what makes the Maharal such an interesting foil for the Rambam, if you really want to get into it, is that the Maharal is a Kabbalist who in particular speaks in the language of philosophy. So in other words, he's he, what he would call it coming down to the level of philosophy, right? He, he comes down to that level so they can have a, a frank discussion, whereas most Kabbalists, right, don't even in their language, are not even philosophically parsable. You can't even render Kabbalah into a philosophical position, at least not easily. Right? Well, I think essentially the idea is that anything that is talked about as a creation of God, of God himself, itself is... Beyond, beyond. Yes, absolutely simple. So it's not, God is not manifesting. No, the whole idea, the whole idea of God manifesting does not exist in Jewish philosophy. Really? Yes. There is no, there, in fact, there is no philosophical basis for it because they're very strict philosophers. And philosophy, as we mentioned last week, is built from the ground up. You start from the creation and you work towards God. Everything we know is either a creation or 
or I don't know God directly, but he must be there, right? So those are the two philosophical modes. I have God who I logically deduce must be there, even though I've never seen him. And I have everything that I see, and everything that I see is a creation. So you have two categories. That's, ph that's philosophy. It's ph We're getting there. One second. The Maharal... It looks to me like, looks to me like so simple that, that I feel myself like we are a, a bunch of bees running to a hive and there's a bee queen sitting over there and feeding her and she continues to produce more... Who's the, bee, who's the bee queen? God. Oh, okay. Just try in the metaphor. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, uh, because we... Uh, no, I, I believe it's not like that. It's obviously. But the... the, the not, so not only is the Torah description of God seemingly not like what the Rambam says, but philosophically, in, in reason, there's issues with it as well. In fact, another thing the Maharal of Prague points out, please, um, another thing the Maharal of Prague points out is that God in the Talmud, right, the holy sages, whose philosophy we really only know implicitly and, and the greatest geniuses in Jewish history have had to work to reverse engineer the philosophy of the sages, which certainly exists, by the way, and is what could probably be called the, the true philosophy of Judaism, right? It's just so difficult to get it out of the Talmud, right? Because the Talmud is not, almost the entire Talmud is totally not philosophical at all in an explicit way. The Talmud talks about practical halacha, right? If your ox gores a cow, right? Nevertheless, if you really, really, really can think, which is a, maybe a rarer thing than, than we sometimes suppose, you can find the philosophy uh, that's within the Talmud. This is what certain great thinkers were famous for doing, like, for example, of Chaim Brisker, the Ragach of Ergon. There are certain rabbis who were known for this entire approach called Cheker Halacha, understanding the philosophy implicit within the Talmud. But anyway, the... The important thing is that in the Talmud, when they talk about God, you will notice what's the name for God in the Talmud. Generally, the name for God in the Talmud is Hakadosh Baruch Hu. That's the name for God, right? You're thinking of um, of, uh, of, um, of Rahman, yeah. yeah, after Rahmanos, after his trait of mercy, the merciful one. But other than that, he's called Hakadosh Baruch Hu. He's called the Holy One. Blessed be he. The, Rab, the Maharal points out he is called, his, the word that they chose, they could have chosen any word to describe him. The word they chose to describe God is holy. Holy means separate, removed, transcendent. Right? That's what the word holy means. And there, what's the Maharal's point by saying this? The Maharal's point is, is that in the Rambam's assessment, the, it's, very, it's a subtle thing. So like I said, this is not the easiest subject matter in the world. I'm going to explain it. It's a subtle thing. The Rambam says that there is no such thing as God's knowledge, because there is only God. In the process of saying there is no such thing as God's knowledge, there's only God, the, the Maharal says that the Rambam lowers God to the level of knowledge. Right? He lowers God himself to the level of knowledge for the following reason. Because... Ultimately, when God knows what's going on on earth, which all um, Jews believe, right? F fundamentally, fundamental principle of Judaism. In other words, what I'm trying to say is the Maharal and the Rambam both agree 100%. God is aware of what's going on on earth, right? The Rambam has nowhere to put that awareness except in the simplicit reality of God himself. God himself knows what's going on on earth. Which means, which means that in some way, even though the Maharal knows that the Rambam only does this with negative theology and he's really saying what God is and not what God is, but at the end of the day, God must be something like a mind, right? God must be something like a knower, right? Because he knows. I understand that it's not in the way that I know, etc., right? But at the end of the day, the Rambam has nowhere to put the verb, the action of knowing, the, the state of God's omniscience, he has nowhere to put it except in God himself, which means, in the words of the Maharal, that, God, that the Rambam is not calling God HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he would call God HaSeichel Baruch Hu. He would call God the mind, blessed be he. 
right? Because he is God has been lowered down, right? To truly some it's it's the Rambam says it's a mind that we can't know, right? But at the end of the day, the trait is ascribed to God Himself, right? What's a metaphor for this? A metaphor for this is things that are not God you can know directly. I use a metaphor from colors. I've said this in this class before, right? Things that are not God you can know directly. This is like there are certain colors that are within the visible spectrum for a human being to see, right? I can see my green and my purple and the millions and millions of shades, right? Although not an infinite number, a finite number, as I think science would say, right? There's a certain number of millions of shades that human beings can see, and all of those shades are a combination of much fewer um, constituents of primary colors in light and in, and in pigments, etc., whatever it is, right? There's a certain limited finite range to visible light, right, to what we can see. The Rambam says that if you take all of the colors in the universe and then you realize that God, the call God the great painter, right, instead of the mind, Right, that's the metaphor. I'm using a metaphor, right? If you call God the great painter and look at the, you're trying to understand God. He is the source of all of these colors. You need someone to explain what's the source of all of these colors. But God, of course, is not any particular color, right? This is the metaphor, right? God is not any particular color. He's not a known color, right? God is the source of all colors, and in fact. I don't know how he's the source of the color, so he probably even possesses colors that we don't know and things like that, right? God might know colors far beyond what he put into his uh, universe, perhaps, right, to, to some extent, right? However, at the end of the day, the God that you are knowing through ex extrapolating from the known colors, right, is at the end of the day a painter. God himself is a painter, right? He himself is the source of colors, right? The Maharal is saying, not only does God have colors that we don't know, God has things we don't know that we don't know, right? That's the difference, right? The Maharal says, God is totally beyond knowledge. What he means is, not only can you not say what he is, you can't even say what he isn't, Right? The Rambam says, I can say what God isn't. I can say he's not ignorant. He knows. Right? The Maharal says, you're limiting him too much. God is actually, he is what Donald Rumsfeld would call an unknown unknown. Right? God is, he, there's the known unknown, and then there's the unknown unknown. Right? God is the latter. God is, he doesn't just have an infinite number of colors, he has an infinite number of things that you've never heard of as well. Right? He's totally beyond and transcendent, above and beyond. God is not an idea. He's not a mind. All of these are things that you can point at with the limited uh, vision of the human mind. But of course, God is totally beyond these things, right? Isn't he touching you there? Before? Yes, we've, we've spoken about all of this before in this class. If this sounds familiar, it's because you've heard it all before, right? God is absolutely transcendent, right? I, what does it mean when the Torah says that God knows or God is wise? Two things that the Torah says, right? The Maharal, remember when the, the, in the, with the Rambam we had to deal this, with this in one way. The Maharal deals with it in a different way. He says when the Torah says God is wise, we're not talking about God himself. We're talking about things that God does. It's not him, right? Achare, um... Um, oh, I forgot the language in Hebrew, but God is called by his behavior. He's called after his name, after what he does. That's the Kabbalistic position. The Kabbalistic position is God himself is totally transcendent, totally unknowable. The correct name for him is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be he, which means wherever you are, he's beyond you. That's really what the name means, right? It's actually the same with the Yiddish word that the Rebbe would use for God all the time, which is the Ebishter, right? Ebishter comes from the Yiddish word Eben, which means the one above, right? It means whatever you're talking about, he's above it, right? He's not the thing you're talking about, he's above it. In, in, other, words, in other words, yeah, in other words, he's transcendent, right? He's totally transcendent. However, as I hope some of you realize, this causes problems in the other direction because the Rambam's whole worldview of saying that God was one with his knowledge was here to explain how God can know anything, right? The Rambam's answer was, is we don't know. The Maharal says, 
I, God does something to know. It's not that he in his, uh, in his transcendent absolute simplicity knows. Him knowing is, is an action that he does, right? It's a descent from him. It's some behavior of the divine that we're describing. This opens up the whole can of worms that the Rambam was trying to seal, right? This makes the whole problem because how can you say that God actively knows Right? Isn't God absolutely simple? And in fact, the Maharal is trying to say that the God he's describing is even more absolutely simple than the God that the Rambam was describing. Absolutely transcendent, right? So now, how does the Kabbalist say that God knows? Right? How does the Kabbalist say that the that God is is um, is knowing? In fact, what the Kabbalist seems to be saying is that God's knowledge sounds it sounds like that to the kabbalist god's knowledge is like a creation right the exact same thing that the rap because the rambam can't put god's knowledge in the creation so he puts it in god right the maharal can't put god's knowledge in god right because god is not knowledge god is totally transcendent of knowledge right so where do the kabbalists put god's knowledge it sounds like the only answer is to make it as a creation which makes no sense because knowledge by definition right implies unity with the one who knows right it's it's if you think about god's knowledge as a creation things become ridiculous because then you start asking well how does he even know his knowledge right because his knowledge is not within him in other words the thing that the knowledge has been coming to explain which is how can god know this coffee cup especially when it moves right the thing that his knowledge has been coming to explain now needs the same explanation itself right because now his knowledge is something like this coffee cup so i need an explanation of how he can even know his knowledge right it's a huge mess long story short which is why the rambam went the way that he did right even and he bit the bullet and took all of the consequences of that position you see right you see that the problem i'm trying to show you this is how learning torah works outside of Hasidus, where there's a univocal um, one voice of truth, which just tells you how it is, right? Most Torah learning is not like this. Most Torah learning is much more like understanding the tensions and why each one goes his own way in the debate between the Ramam and the Maharal. This is what uh, we're getting a taste of Torah learning in our Hasidus class, right? But reading about, in all this, I'm not understanding that this present is felt strong. One second, I'm not, done, I'm not done with my presentation yet. One second. This present is felt What's the nature? What's the nature of God's knowledge? So each side, right? They're in a fight. Maral says one way, and he has his issues. The Rambam says his way, and he has his issues. The second, the footnote in the second chapter of Tanya is the first time, although not the last in Tanya. The Alter Rebbe repeats this idea multiple times, and as I said, it becomes foundational and discussed in hundred, over hundreds of pages of Hasidic discourses. Right. The Alter Rebbe says the radical position, he incredibly says that they're both right. That's the Alter Rebbe's position. They're both right. The Maharal and the Rambam are not, as, are not irreconcilable. They are actually reconcilable and reconciled. In other words, when you ask what's the nature of God's knowledge, the answer is it depends what you're talking about. That's the answer. In one, in one sense, what you're, the answer is, is the Rambam is right, right? God is his knowledge. In a different sense, the answer to the question is, is God is totally transcendent of, of, of his knowledge, of his knowledge of the world, right? There's also different types of knowledge, etc., which is a, a complication that, that's not even touched on by the Alter Rebbe. Here, pardon me. The famous story in Hasidus about, um, which I've said in this class multiple times, but I'll say it again, Right, the famous uh, story is is that when Rabbi El Khan used to teach, um, used to teach of blessed memory, used to teach uh, Hasidus in 770 in the Rebbe's Yeshiva, he would teach the Hasidic discourse, and some student would say, "But doesn't that contradict what you told us three months ago in such and such a place?" Rabbi El's answer was always "Sevensich vumeret" in Yiddish, which means it depends where you're talking about. Right? In other words, what we were talking about there was true in a certain context, in a certain way. But this is actually a different case, so it doesn't apply across all cases. A lot of Kabbalah is like this. Kabbalah is a very in, a, in its way, is a very relative form of knowledge. So in other words, when you say 
when you're learning any Kabbalist and they say something is the case, right, they mean it in a qualified way, and very rarely do they tell you outright in what qualified sense they mean it, right? That's left as a little exercise for the reader. So the the Rabbi Yo would always answer, it depends where you're talking about, right? So one of the students thought that they would be very clever, and when Rabbi Yo gave them the test at the end of the, at the, end of the semester, and Rabbi Yo asked them, uh, uh, what's higher, what's lower, what's this, what's that, the student thought he would be clever and he answered in every question, he answered, he answered every question, Sevensich Vumaret, he answered every question, it depends where you're talking about, right, because he thought he'd get back at his teacher who answered every question, it depends, right, so he answered on his test, it depends, every answer, right, and of course, as the famous story goes, Rabbi Yo gave him a zero, failed, failed the test, right, and the student went and complained to Rabbi Yo, he said, you answer every question, Sevensich Vumaret. How come I can't answer on my test, Sevensich Vumaret? Rabbi El told him, ah, it turns out that Sevensich Vumaret is also Sevensich Vumaret, right? It depends where you're talking about. Also, it depends where you're talking about. So when I say it, it's right, right? When you say it, when I say it, it's because I know something. When you say it, it's because you don't know anything, right? So that also, this answer also depends where, right? Also depends where. Anyway, so the, the, the Alter Rebbe is going to explain like this. The Maharal is right that God is beyond wisdom, and wisdom to him is like is as distant from him as an external creation. Right? The Maharal is right. The Maharal is right that God is beyond wisdom, and that wisdom to him is like a, is like kasiya gufanis, as it says, is like a um, is like a, um, the creation of his wisdom is distant from him, like the physical world is distant from him. Right? On the other hand, the Alter Rebbe is going to say that the Rambam is right, that God descends to know. There is a state, there is a place where it is true that God and his knowledge are absolutely one, that God just is his knowledge, right? The place where that is true is called the Ten Spheres of Atzillus. That's the name of the place where this is true, that in the process of creation, there is a place in that process which is a viable and legitimate description of God. In other words, it's not just that there's some place which is not God where this is true. There is a way of looking at God. There is a perspective on God himself where the Rambam is correct, right? Because you're saying in the world as opposed to in the ten spheres? Although the scripture of God uh, actually fit to the level of Atsilu. But you mentioned not Atsilu, you mentioned the ten sphere of Atsilu. Right. So I'm asking why Atsilu has to be distributed to ten. Why not Atsilu as one? I'm not sure I follow exactly what you're saying. The sphere would be separated to ten sphere. Right. But in that case, why Atsilu is not solely to that qualification of God? Because when you say God's wisdom, God's wisdom is Chachma Batsilus, right? Is one of the ten spheres. And so too, the other traits of God are the other spheres, right? So, the reason this is important to know, and the Alter Rebbe is discussing this when we say that the soul comes from the wisdom of God, right, which is really what our chapter is about, that the godly soul comes from God's chachma, comes from God's wisdom, right? They have to both be right. Why? I'll explain. Because if God himself is totally beyond wisdom, like the Maharal seems to imply, right, then saying that the soul comes from God's mind has nothing to do with being a piece of God. Right. You may as, may as well say the soul comes from God's coffee cup for the same price, right? After all, is this not God's coffee cup, right? Charlie Buttons, right? It's not a piece of God. It's a piece of God's coffee cup. It's exactly what I'm saying, right? In other words, what do I gain by saying it's from God's wisdom? God's, God is not one with his wisdom. Right? God transcends his wisdom. So if the Maharal is right, saying the soul comes from God's wisdom accomplishes nothing. It's not a piece of God, right? On the other hand, if God is his wisdom, right? If God is his wisdom, then it's very, very difficult to understand, like the Rambam says, right? It's very, very difficult to understand how the soul can be a creation and yet also be a piece of God, right? Because the Rambam, in the Rambam's view, there's only creation and God, and the soul is definitely not God, 
right? You are not God, surprisingly. The um, the so therefore you must be a creation. That's the those are the uh, those are the options basically, right? So if you want to say that the soul is a piece of God and comes from God's mind, right? Really, both of these positions have to be true. It has to come from the place where they overlap, where on the one hand, God is one with his wisdom, but on the other hand, God is totally transcendent of his wisdom, right? It has to come from, from a view where really both of these things hold, right? <sighs> Which is okay. What's your what, what are you proposing? Well, we're trying to understand the Torah. It's not you have to understand. It's not just us trying to understand better, right? right? So in other words, you would need a third way of explaining everything the Torah says, including that the soul is a piece of God and that the soul comes from God's wisdom. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure I follow because exactly. Is, uh, yes, you, the Torah says that God is one. The Torah also says God knows, right? You run away oh, and figure out no, how both are true, right? It, which is, I mean, I guess this is the way to describe it. The Torah says it's only for us to understand. That is a decision you have made. That is an interpretive decision, right? So that's not neither of them is right, actually. That's one of them is right. That decision itself, right? How to understand the Torah, that's the question. That's why we have the Shema, the fact that it connects us to ways. But it's so in our worldview. What? What, what is? To understand it. That is a decision, again, of understanding the Torah. You're saying, see, here's the thing, is that you've learned that and you've heard that, right? But that's a shita. That's one position, right? But that position is not beneath all the other shitas. That position is actually contradicted, right? It's argued against. There's a whole different way of understanding it. It doesn't have to be just for our description. It could actually be literal. When it says God knows, there is an actual act that God undertakes that's not just for our benefit, right? The Maharal will tell you. Right, it's a totally different shita. Who, who says, right? So, there's something called the ten spheres, okay? Here is where we start getting into the part of the class that really, really, we can't really deal with properly at all. Um, the good news is, is that over the coming chapters of Tanya, we'll get into this a lot more. And also in the coming classes, even on chapter two, because we'll have a we'll discuss the four worlds where the Alter Rebbe talks about them, which is right after right after this point, right? And we'll discuss the four worlds and what they mean, etc. But the very, very short version is like this. There's something called God's wisdom, which is called the first of the ten spheres of Atsilus, which is Chachma, right? Of Atsilus, so you have the spheres. The spheres are to put it extremely coarsely and briefly and frankly incorrectly, the ten spheres are the ten means by which God creates. God has ten tools in his toolbox that he uses to create, right? If you want to put it in a way that a five-year-old could understand. Those ten things, are, we're going to quickly understand why this, this doesn't work, right? But God has ten things in his toolbox. Those ten things are found first in their in the form that we know them, and the form that goes on to create our universe are found in a world called Atsilus, which is the highest of four types of worlds, right? Which is called the world of emanation. There's the world of emanation, Atsilus, which is followed by the world of creation, Bria, which is followed by the world of formation, which is Yitzira. None of these are one world, by the way. All of these are many, many worlds. They're categories of worlds. And then after the world of Yetzirah, you have the world of Asiyah, which is the world of action. And then when that world of action is attached to physical matter, that's when we start running into things that we recognize, right? Like coffee cups, for example. So you have all of these many, many, many worlds in all of these different categories. These worlds, you have to, you have to think totally differently to understand what we mean by worlds, right? These worlds are not anywhere other than where we're sitting right now. These worlds are all present. They're not spatially differentiated. Right? They're right here. The only thing is that you can't see them. And in fact, who can see what is actually what determines which world they're in. Right? Which, or in the word, in the language of Hasidus, which vessels are able to receive which light determines which reality you're in. Okay? So 
you have these ten spheres of the world of Attilus, which is the, 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 the first of the four categories of worlds in Kabbalah. It's all Kabbalah means by you. The spheres, these ten spheres, each of which is made up of light and vessel, whatever that means, right? Each of them is a light in a vessel, totally undefined terms at the moment. They're totally one with God. Now, how can ten things be one with God? The answer is, is that there's not really ten. The ten are really one, right? The ten are, the, the one thing, which is the spheros, is called ten for ten facets from our perspective. As the Alter Rebbe explains in the second part of Tanya, some of you might remember this when we studied this in the second part of the Tanya, okay? The wisdom that is, so, so like this, the Alter Rebbe's, um, what the Altar Rebbe is going to say in the footnote, which is again uniting the Rambam and the Maharal, right? The Altar Rebbe says like this God has something called wisdom, which is a sphera in the world of Atsilus. In other words, all you really need to know about that is that it's not Him, right? In fact, it's something very much like what He creates, it's very distant from Him, right? However, despite the fact that it is emphatically not Him and something that He brings into being, right? It is absolutely and completely united with him in light, in vessel, and in their unity, right? In the, 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 um, the three aspects of the sphero, which the Rebbe the Tzemach Tzedek actually says, that we learned in this class once, actually refers to the knower, the knowledge, and the known, actually refers to the light, the vessel, and their unity. Is actually the three things, right? That are absolutely one. So in other words, in other words, what comes out is like this. As strange as it might sound, everything that the Rambam philosophically says about God is true, but not about God himself. It's true about the ten spheres in the world of Atsilus, right? And if you ask me how could the Rambam mistake one for ten, the answer is, is there's not actually ten, right? What the Rambam, what ph philosophically you would call God, the absolutely first simple being, right, who knows everything by knowing itself, right, and which gives rise to all uh, uh, contingent and complex beings that we know, right, this is not God. This is the ten spheres of Atsilus in an absolute unity, which is in turn absolutely united with God, right. Now, if it sounds paradoxical, that's because it is. And like I said, go learn those hundreds of pages of discourses. You have to understand what exactly we mean. There's something called the tzimtzum, where God um, um, conceals the, the self that is totally transcendent of knowledge, right? Only to reveal himself once more and unite with it again. And many, many of these contractions, many, many of these tzimtzumim are part of what makes this whole process complete. We, could al we would also benefit from remembering the entire previous discourse that we learned before we started Tanya, right? Which is all about how the self-concealment and the self-revelation of God are all really the same thing and all absolutely one, right? It's like God hiding his face with his own hands and the self cannot conceal himself and hopefully these things for longtime members of the class are ringing some bells because these are all related topics right how can Atsilus be totally one with God if it's a concealment and a descent from God the answer is, is that it's not really a descent really it's a unity right all of these different things but the bottom line is is that it comes out like this the Rambam and the Kabbalists absolutely agree about the ten spheres of Atsilus. They would agree that God is his knowledge in that place. And that is the place that the godly soul, as we're going to read in the Tanya, that is the place that the godly soul comes from. The godly soul comes from that reality of Atsilus, which means it comes from God's wisdom there. And God's wisdom there is absolutely one with God. Right? So it comes out that sort of with the Rambam and the Maharal explaining it together, right? you can understand what the Alter Rebbe means when he says the soul comes from God's wisdom. Right? It comes from the Svira in Atsilus. It comes from this emanation of God and derives from that place. I would like to read the Alter Rebbe's footnote to finish the class, right? And then we'll, uh, then we'll finish. And next week, God willing, we'll continue more. So we are on. Get my safer here. Pardon me. I'm going to read you this footnote. It's the footnote on page 12 and page 6.
The Alter Rebbe's note. The Hoydulei Chachmei Kabbalah. What, what's this quoting on? This is saying that God, that the Rambam says God and His wisdom are one, right? Someone who knows Kabbalah, who studied the Maharal of Prague, would say God and His wisdom are not one. What are you talking about? God is totally transcendent of His wisdom, right? Comes the Alter Rebbe to tell you the Hoydulei Chachmei Kabbalah. The the um, the sages, the Kabbalistic sages, admitted that the Rambam was correct. As the Ramak says in his Pardes, the Gam Lefi Kabbalah Arizal, and even in the Kabbalah of the Arizal, right? Why is it and even in the Kabbalah of the Arizal? This is really also a long discussion that, that really we need more time to fully explain. But the short answer is it's even the Arizal because the Arizal introduced a concept called the Tzimtzum Arishon, the first Tzimtzum, which means essentially that. The Arizal introduced the idea that to God, his wisdom and this coffee cup are equally distant from God. He introduced that idea to the Kabbalah, right? Before him, you would say they were both very distant from God, but his wisdom was closer, right? The Arizal was much more absolute. The Arizal, who the Alter Rebbe is a student of, by the way. The Arizal is much more absolute. He says God's wisdom, right, what you would call wisdom, and this physical coffee cup are the equal distance from the end self, are the e- are equidistant from God. In other words, a different way of saying this is God is infinitely removed from his wisdom. Yes? But even he, Yetziva Milsa, agrees that God is one with his knowledge. Besaid, by dint of the the esoteric doctrine of, translating Besaid, the esoteric doctrine of, his lavshus oren soif baruchu ayyadei tzimtzumim rabim bekelim dechabad da'atzilus. The enclothing of his, of the, the the infinite uh, his blessed infinite light through many contractions in the vessels of God's mind of Chachma bin Endas in the world of Atzilus, right? Which is the you see why we're reading it at the end because the as I explained to you what this means already it will be much harder to go from the text forward. Yes, I explained to you what this means already. However, where the Kabbalists start disagreeing is above that world, above the world of Atzilus, above that place about which Hasidus and Kabbalah the same. There's many, many things and levels and realities above that one, right? Above that place, God is totally transcendent of wisdom. God and wisdom are not are not united and are not in any way synonymous above that place, right? As is written elsewhere, the, the infinite one, the one without end, blessed be he, is uh, transcendent and exalted with many, many, with infinite exaltations above and beyond the nature of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. To the extent that God's own wisdom is really considered like a physical object to him, right? The way uh, that that's the same relationship it has with him, meaning above the world of Atsilus, the two things diverge. And from that perspective, everything is infinitely removed from God. But in the perspective of the world of Atsilus, where God unites where the Ein Sof contracts itself to be within the vessels of Attilus, whatever that means, right, where God lowers himself down to have a mind, is one way of putting it, right, in that place, right, God's mind and him are absolutely one, and everything the philosophers say about God is true of that thing, right? When the philosophers talk, in other words, when the philosophers talk about God, there's really so much, we could speak for another hour about this, but the, the, when the philosopher, in the Kabbalist's opinion, and the Alter Rebbe is on the side of the Kabbalists ultimately, although he has his own path, right? His own path to the Kabbalah and explaining the Kabbalah. And Hasidus is not really Kabbalah at the end of the day, but that's a discussion for a different time. If the, if the, in the eyes of the Alter Rebbe, when the philosopher uses the world to deduce truths about God, right? It's like they're looking in a way, almost at like a superimposed image that gets it, that 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 they can see from their particular perspective, right? In other words, from this place, I see a particular aspect where God just is His knowledge, right, and just is His will, and these things are all the same thing. It's just God and God only, God's, right? 
that understanding is about God. The Kabbalists agree. In other words, the Rambam isn't making a mistake and calling some lower level God. You misunderstand this whole thing if, you, if, you, if, you, if that's the conclusion you come to. The philosophers are not calling some lower thing God, right? It's God that they're describing because that place is totally united with him. There is nothing to the ten spheres of Attilus other than God. That's all they are. They're totally united with him without remainder, right? They have no being of their own. That He's talking about God, right? But the Kabbalists would tell you, and the Kabbalists don't know this from deduction. They know this because the Torah told them. It's Kabbalah. It's received wisdom, right? The Kabbalists know, pardon me, the Kabbalists know that this is not God himself, right? It's something that's absolutely one with God, right? And it's not even really a mistake in the sense that if you are working, if you limit yourself to the tools of rational reason, right, this is the God you will find based on the tools you've limited yourself to as a philosopher, right? But it is God that you're describing. That's the Kabbalists admit, right, that there is that that what what we're saying about God is true in a certain in a certain perspective from a certain point of view there's a certain place there's a certain reality where god and his wisdom are absolutely one and it turns out that is the reality from which the godly soul derives so the godly soul comes from god's wisdom which means that it can still be a piece of god above literally because god and his wisdom meaning the sphera of chachma the world of atzilus are absolutely and completely one the altar finishes the note. The verse says they were all made with wisdom, right? Which you can interpret in many ways. But the Kabbalistic way of understanding this verse is that Chachma is like an action to God, right? In other words, God's wisdom, God is totally transcendent of his wisdom, just as he is totally transcendent of his action, which even Maimonides would agree with. So I told you there's a lot going on here. This is a very juicy um, and deep and rich uh, vein that we've tapped onto. But in the second chapter of Tanya, we really are only mentioning it in passing. We'll have to come back to many of these topics and many of these things later on as we progress. Particularly if you enjoyed the more Kabbalistic parts of tonight's lecture, soon, God willing, we're going to have a much longer class, a much longer discussion about the four worlds in particular and what we mean by the world of emanation, etc. Because that is what the Alter Eb is about to start talking about in the actual uh, pnim, in the actual body of the text outside of the, beyond the footnote. Thank you very much. Everyone have a good evening. Okay, let's go to Israel now.